Check. How loud? How loud can? How loud can I talk? There. All right. Let's go. Surrealism. Surrealism. This is something I've never talked about before in my life. I don't think. At least, I mean, online, online. We're going to get to surrealism. Uh, first, I wanted to start out with something because someone informed me that there was a quotation that I was looking for that I didn't know that I was looking for. But we're going to start with that, which is from Nietzsche and Nietzsche's take on metaphysics from human all to human. So I thank you to whoever sent me that. Uh, or some, they, they summarized the statement for me. And I thought it was good because I went and found it. Nietzsche on metaphysics. And why he doesn't prefer it. And it, you got to take this with the grain of salt. That's not his interest. It's allowed to be your interest. No one is saying it can't be. I'm not, I'm not the cop in your head. But I tend to agree with this take. So this is from Human All Too Human. Of first and last things and he talks about the metaphysical world which will lead into the discussion about surrealism so it's not off topic it is true there may be a metaphysical world the absolute possibility of it can scarcely be disputed possibility remember we see we all see all things through the medium of the human head and we cannot well cut off this head. Although there remains the question of what part of the world would be left after it had been cut off. So, of course, you know, what do we add to perception? And there's probably something beyond perception because the world is narrativized into a way that makes sense, more or less. But that is a purely abstract scientific problem and one not much calculated to give men uneasiness. Yet everything that has hither or heretofore made metaphysical assumptions valuable, fearful, or delightful to men, all that gave rise to them is passion, error, and self-deception. The worst systems of knowledge, not the best, pin their tenets of belief thereto. When such methods are brought to view as the basis of all existing religions and metaphysics, they are already discredited. There always remains, however, the possibility already conceded. But nothing can be made out of that to say not a word about letting happiness, salvation, and life hang upon the threads spun from such a sensibility. Or, sorry, possibility. Accordingly, nothing could be predicted of the metaphysical world beyond the fact that it is an elsewhere, another sphere, inaccessible and incomprehensible to us. It would be a thing of negative properties. Even were the existence of such a world absolutely established, it would nevertheless remain incontrovertible that all kinds of knowledge, knowledge of such a world, would be of the least consequence, of even less consequence than knowledge of chemical analysis of water would be to a storm-tossed mariner. So even if metaphysics were true, and even if we could figure it out, even if that were possible, it still wouldn't matter to Nietzsche. So dedicating all of your philosophical energies and all your thought energies to discussions of metaphysics, to him, is not the best way to use your time. It would be like being in a storm and knowing what the chemical composition of water is. It might be cool to know, but it's not really going to help you out. So feel free to disagree with him on that take but I share it. 
And that means, uh, picking up on our discussion yesterday, yeah, yeah, two days in a row, we are on a roll, that values are good, actually. That knowing that values are values is good, actually. And it does, in, in a sense, mean that the world, part of the experience of the world, at least, is a collective hallucination. And to some degree within that, you can choose your hallucination. Because God is unconscious and he's not going to come, he's not going to come check on you at the end of the day to make sure you got it right or that you are getting it right. There's no test. This isn't going to be on the test at the end and no one's grading it. So look, then just for shits and giggles, not that we have a, a unified political project, but for shits and giggles, you can just think, what world do I want? What world would I create? And uh, the Surrealists are going to give one answer to that, particularly Breton, who I'm going to read today. And yesterday, we got into a whole bit of a discussion about, like, what, what world would you design? Or if you had friends that shared your values, which world would you design? Would you want a world that's designed by, like, corporate branding and do you want to consume what other people make or do you want to make your own shit but our world is the one where corporate branding this is why i have this tab open our world is the one that corporate branding decides what we look at and they have decided on this if we got if we got graphic designers out there you will know this because you probably had to learn it but corporate Memphis is, I guess it's kind of fading out a little bit now. Um, if you remember what before it says here, this was the late 2010s and early 2020s. Before this, corporate branding was, it was trendy to go like 3D or faux 3D, I should say, on your icons and all that stuff. And then it became cool to be flat and geometric. And this is, of course, it says widely associated with uh, big tech. It has been criticized by some as uninspired or dystopian, though some illustrators have defended the style, pointing out what they claim to be its art historical legitimacy. But I'm sure, like, as soon as I show you this, you know what this looks like because basically everybody uses it. And what kind of strikes me about it, except for this little Goya-inspired piece, but the rest of it, it's like faceless people. We got our diversity represented, but the flatness, the absolute um, inoffensiveness, I would call it, the thing that defines it is just to be absolutely inoffensive. We have a sad, a sad designer here being forced to do corporate Memphis style, but totally inoffensive, totally flat, which not to get too ideology critique up in here, but it kind of represents the world they're going for in more than an accidental way. And it might be shifting. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. You can see why it would be valuable. Um, we are going to go today to before corporate Memphis was a thing. Uh, we got Nietzsche here. Oh, first, before we do this, I want to paint you a little, little tiny bit of a picture about where we're coming from. I, well, we could go to the board, actually. So this is the book that we're taking a look at today, which is The Manifestos of Surrealism.
And right before we get there, this is my this is what I think De Boer would say. You know, the Society of Spectacle. What he would say about corporate Memphis. The satisfaction that no longer comes from using the commodities produced in abundance is now sought through the recognition of their value as commodities. Consumers are filled with religious fervor for the sovereign freedom of commodities whose use has become an end in itself. Just like these faceless, blank, absolutely flat characters that fill, fill the design style, uh, waves of enthusiasm for particular products are propagated by all communications media. And this is where he talks about the interconnection of media with consumption, you know, your, your Spider-Man backpack that every kid wants, and your Spider-Man Lego, and everything is intertwined with the spectacle. Waves of enthusiasm for, a, for particular products are propagated by all the communications media. A film sparks a fashion craze. A magazine publi publicizes night spots, which in turn spin off different lines of products. The proliferation of faddish gadgets reflects the fact that as a mass of commodities becomes increasingly absurd, absurdity itself becomes a commodity. Which is just to say, as we know already, overproduction and consumption are like the, the coin of capitalism to the point where absurdity becomes its own commodity. And it leaves you probably as a, as a subject stuck in a hallucination that you're kind of okay with. It's kind of fine to be stuck in a hallucination because there's no guilt in passivity. I would like to give you a little bit of guilt at being stuck in passivity. And not just a way out of it by being like an activist consumer where you consume the right things or you give money to the right things um, visibly. So you become a visible or conspicuous consumer. Because that just reiterates uh, DeBoard's point my favorite dictum that what is good is what appears and what appears is thereby good. Ethical consumption is like this value added thing to the act. And ethical consumption can now be like, I don't know, consuming the right YouTube too. It has moral value. It has moral value which which e celebrity is your favorite one and then you can pray for people on the news so please don't do this <laughs> consuming anti anti-capitalist media including this book is not really anti-capitalist there's two logics at play at the same time and the critique is magical and the critique falls into the same structure as the action that everybody else does no one's special Hurrah. Um, and this is what leads into surrealism, because surrealism lost, if you want to call it this, it lost its little culture war, you could say. So to paint the picture, the, the historical picture, I guess, of uh, what was going on in Paris at the time, You have, before the war, Paris is like the center of art creativity and literature creativity and poetry, and it's kind of considered the place where everyone goes. There's a movie about this that uh, Owen Wilson is in, Paris, Mid Midnight in Paris, where he has... There's like a time machine that takes him back to, I think it's 1930s uh, Paris. And this is for him very special because he is a novelist and the movie's all about nostalgia. So m if I can like reduce this, you got, you got the HP 
people. You got the people studying Heidegger and Husserl and Hegel, like Kojev and Hippolyte and Sartre and Sartre kind of wins this fight against the surrealists because the communists, the Marxists, they don't like surrealism very much. Surrealism is much more inspired by Freud, I think you could say. So they are into dreams. They are into uh, crazy images. And they kind of lose because... The critique of them is you're too concerned with the fantasy world and you're not concerned enough with, with production and like the actual states of living people. But they produced some cool art. Um, and more than that, we, we remember it as an art movement, but it was also more than that. This is what the manifesto is for is that it's supposed to be like a political movement as well. It's supposed to be something that gives you an avenue to escape from uh, consumer culture, but you kind of escape it by the logic of dreams. You kind of embrace the hallucination and try to recover the parts of the unconscious that are repressed, and that's what makes it sort of... Uh, makes it sort of Freudian. And you do that through art, and not just like visual art, but uh, poetry and literature and, and stuff like that. And it's not very popular anymore. But for self-help purposes, I don't know, it might be useful. Surrealist self-help. That's why I called it this. It's the cult, if you want in. It's a cult of uh, the return of the repressed. They're big into magic. They're big into uh, imagery and icon and a lot of the stuff that we don't seem to care about. And they really thought this is the, th the thing that I miss and the thing that makes me nostalgic like Owen Wilson is they really thought that art could change the world. I wish that we had that belief. Um, and it's not very popular anymore, like I said, because it's kind of hard to understand. It's aesthetic without trying to be maybe too political. And I don't know. Do you know any surrealist stuff? I'm sure there's a lot of music that you could classify as surrealism. Um, but not so much TV. There was a show. I don't know if it was popular. It was a couple, couple of years ago. It was X-Men um, Legion. And the director, this was before like Marvel bought all the rights to their own stuff back, you know, like the Daredevil era when other companies were allowed to make uh, Marvel stuff. Um, but Legion, it was surprisingly good and surprisingly experimental. And then I think when, when it's about the main X-Men guy, Dr. X's son, and it's very, it's directed in a very surreal style. Another one I can think of is uh, The Leftovers, which is a show, good show, but not too popular. And and you're 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 anticipating the critique already, doesn't it? Just feed back into capitalism with the commodification of fantasy. Pretty much, that's the ultimate result of it. But that wasn't their intention. They thought it was kind of an escape from the routinization and codification. Oh, Twin Peaks, of course. Yes, Twin Peaks is like the the apex. That should have been my first example. Um, so what did the Surrealists want? Because thankfully we have a whole bunch on what the Surrealists wanted. Anyway, the end of this little, this little uh, culture war is Sartre kind of won. Sartre became the main dude, the most popular dude, uh, especially post-war. 
and surrealism fell off. I don't know all the reasons for that, but it basically lost to the Marxist, the Marxist critique of it. Or maybe it's just because it was like so heavily commodified, maybe even immediately. I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, like Bataille, Bataille was, he was ultimately hostile to surrealism, but influenced by probably, and he was writing a book on it. And for some reason, he never finished the book. Maybe it just became a, a, a unpopular or no one, no one was really doing it anymore. But uh, it, was not, it was not a non-issue. If you want some images. And these just look, you know, they just look like weird shit. But what the idea is, is combining aspects, combining signs, I guess, images, um, in ways that a dream does. Because the dream doesn't function by, obviously, the logic of the real world, but it combines aspects of the real world. So if, if our consciousness is repressed by something like, you know, capitalism, then this would be something that exists outside of it, in their mind. Like, this is the return of the repressed. And especially they thought this was anti-bourgeois. Anti like, the bourgeois and bourgeois style and bourgeois art, this is the enemy, and this is supposed to be against it just because it's, it's weirder and more difficult to understand. Was Bataille expelled from Surrealism by Breton? I don't know. I, I don't know the history. I know he wrote against them. And I also know that he didn't finish the book. I think he published one chapter of the book, but he didn't finish what was supposed to be a full book. Anyway, um, like I said, it's important to note that this is not just an art movement, or they didn't think it was. It's the high time for manifesto. It's uh, manifestos are being written about everything. Everyone's got their little magazine. We got the manifesto from the situationists. And if I can jump ahead here. So we have in his manifestos the political position of surrealism. So I wanted to just start with that. Because, you know, it, I mean, look, in hindsight, of course, it's easy to see where they went wrong. It's easy to say, like these days, of course, when you try to do something outside of capitalism, it will recuperate it. I think that was not perhaps as obvious then as it is now because i don't know the very the ver the people with a lot of foresight saw it coming i'm going to delete my face here a second so that this can actually be read All right, this is just this page. This is the moral or the political position of, of surrealist art. Comrades, good start. When my friends, uh, those two friends, informed me that I was invited to speak to your group, the leftist front, and questioned me about the subject that would be most appropriate for me to speak on before you, I fell to thinking about the very name of your organization, this word front whose use in this sense is a recent phenomenon that has very rapidly become widespread, is enough in itself to remind me that the hard, occasionally tragic, and at the same time exciting realities of this hour, 
these banners that have suddenly began to flap over Europe. Look at the date. These banners that have suddenly began to flap over Europe, setting a common or social front, a single front or a red front, over against a national front. The last battle formation of capitalism are... Oh, look. They thought they were at the end. Isn't that cute? The last battle formation of capitalism are of a sort to imbue me more and more deeply with this idea that we live in an era in which man belongs to himself less than ever, in which he is held responsible for the totality of his acts, no longer before a single conscience, his own, but before the collective conscience of all those who want to have no more to do with the monstrous system of slavery and hunger. Before being a moral conscience, this conscience is a psychological conscience. Sorry, my face is back. Um, but you can see here, he's saying we don't want to do, first of all, leftist politics. We got to take care of the psyche. The situationists said something a little bit similar. Is you have to have what they're calling man here, just humans. Humans in a space where they are not alienated. And that starts in the most private spot in the pre-logic dream space, almost. On the one hand, the reinforcement of the mechanism of oppression based on the family, religion, and the fatherland, obviously Nazism, uh, the recognition of the necessity of man to enslave man, the careful underhanded exploitation of the urgent need to transform society for the sole profit of a financial and industrial oligarchy, the need also to silence the great isolated appeals through which the person who up until now has been intellectually privileged manages sometimes after a long space of time to rouse his fellow man from their apathy. The whole mechanism of stagnation, of regression, of wearing down, this is night. On the other hand, the destruction of social barriers, the hatred of all servitude, the defense of liberty is never a servitude, the prospect of man's right truly to dispose of himself with all the profits to the workers, the assiduous attention to grasping the whole process of dissatisfaction, of moving rapidly forward, of youth, so as to grant the greatest possible right to grasp the entire range of human demands from whatever angle it presents itself. This is day. So very clearly, day versus night, we're in a cosmic war. It's hyper-capitalism, which is fascism, versus the leftist front. In this regard, it is impossible to conceive of a clearer situation. Thus the words, leftist front, told me quite a bit. But as I took the trouble to inform myself about the way your association was set up, as I learned that it brought back intellectuals or brought intellectuals together in close association to fight back against fascism and war, I could not help but think of the double problem that faces today's leftist intellectuals, particularly poets and artists. The very word leftist nevertheless urged me on because of the way it designates in politics on the one hand and in art on the other, two approaches which until further notice may appear to be very different. We know that the adjective revolutionary is generously applied to every work, to every intellectual creator who appears to break with tradition. And I say it appears to break for that mysterious entity tradition that some attempt to describe as being very exclusive has proved for centuries to have a boundless capacity for assimilation. The, ad the adjective which hastily takes into account the indisputable nonconformist will that quickens such a work, such a creator, has the grave defect of becoming confused with one who, t who tends to define a systemic action aiming at the transformation of the world and implying the necessary or the necessity of concretely attacking its real bases. So this is the leftist position, and then he's going to give his own. A most regrettable ambiguity results from this.
I'm not going to read all that. I'll skip to here. What to do? Avant-garde art. Caught between this total lack of comprehension and this completely relative self-seeking comprehension cannot, in my opinion, long put up with such a compromise. Those among the modern poets and artists, the vast majority, I think, who re realizes their work confuses and baffles bourgeois society, who very conscientiously aspire to help bring about a new world, a better world, owe it to themselves to swim against the current that is dragging them into passing for mere entertainers, whom the bourgeoisie will never let up on. So I'm sorry for the very long quotation. It might be a day of some long quotations. But what he's saying that we it's something we don't believe anymore. It almost seems like a naive childish belief to us now because our art is Instagram and our art is NFTs and all that. But he says, if you try to do politics without art, it's going to fail because you need to not just change people's relation to labor. You also need to change their psychological relationship to themselves, which is a similar thing that the, the situationists said, and they broke for different reasons, but you need to re you need to create the world of images so that it doesn't, so that it isn't taken over by the bourgeoisie because the bourgeoisie only want dumb shit. They want easy to understand. They want corporate Memphis shit all the time and only. So it's an appeal to the leftist front here that we, if you want to defeat um, fascism, Fascism is obviously immersed, as he said, immersed in mythology, images, images of the family, images of tradition and the fatherland. It creates a mythology out of this, and you need to have your own version of that as well. So 1935, you know, I wish it were true. It strikes me as, I mean, even today. So it's interesting. You can see at least that this is what they believed in. And today, I don't know that this has lost much of its tenor because we could be putting out the Surrealist Manifesto again uh, simply for the reason that technologically everyone almost has the ability to think of almost anything you can create of or create technologically if it comes to like you know uh printing stuff publishing things you can publish your your unfiltered thoughts at any time everyone has a video camera everyone has a has a microphone um there's 3d printing so virtually anyone could do anything and it just happens to be the case that it's easier not to, so most people don't. And to appreciate or look for this organ that he talks about, well, it's coming up at least, the organ of the imagination, it's what produces what could be. So the first thing you have to do as a political goal is to wake up the imagination. The first step for him is not equitable labor relations. The first step is to wake up the imagination. And to wake up the imagination, you need art before you can get anyone to do anything, which is why we're at night, and he gives the night-day analogy, and this is like the goal. It seems like hopeful. <laughs> seems like hopeful. Um, and before we get there, like we're gonna have we're gonna have all the analogies to 
to childhood and things like that. And he talks about the free imagination because, of course, half of what capitalism does, or I don't know, 75% of what it does, it takes up your time and labor, but then it also wants you to spend all your leisure time consuming. So it colonizes both. You work so that you can consume and you consume so that you can work. Um, and that's the thing that he sees as the first problem. And you can see exactly where this connects in a line with uh, Freudian repression. Because now the, the repression is not necessarily something like the Oedipal complex. But you, you want to free dreams and free the imagination from, from the capitalist scape. And images, images not just in like visual art, but images in, in writing is the way that he believes that can be done. Isn't the reason the imagination is so stifled because there isn't equitable labor relations? I don't think he would say that. I think his concern is that there is no leisure time. There is no time that you own. And you could say that that's a, a labor relationship, but you're not just called upon to produce. You're also called upon to consume if you are a subject of, of capitalism. And one other thing that struck me is the way that he calls on people to use language, because I'm he's a he's a writer. He's not a he's not a visual artist. But the way that he calls upon us to use language makes me feel as though our way of using language is extremely literal. The way that we interpret art, always very literal. It's what's the message? The message is the only thing that matters. Uh, form, you know, that's that's some business for someone else. But give it a hearing, all right? Give it a hearing. I know this seems naive, but give it a hearing. So strong is the belief in life. This is the Surrealist Manifesto. So strong is the belief in life, in what is most fragile in life. Real life, I mean, that in the end, this belief is lost. Man, that inveterate dreamer, daily more discon discontent with his destiny, has trouble assessing the objects he has been led to use, objects that his nonchalance has brought his way, or that he has earned through his own efforts, almost always through his own efforts, for he has agreed to work. At least he has not refused to try his luck, or what he calls his luck. At this point, he feels extremely modest. He knows what women he has had. Sorry for the uh, gendered universal here. It's 1930. No, this is 1924, I think, actually. Um, what silly affairs he has been involved in. He is unimpressed by his wealth or poverty. In this respect, he is still a newborn babe. As for the approval of his conscience, I, conf I confess that he does very nicely without it. If he still retains a certain lucidity, all he can do is turn back towards his childhood, childhood, which, however his guides and mentors may have botched it, still strikes him as somehow charming. There, the absence of any known restrictions allows him the perspective of several lives lived at once. This illusion becomes firmly rooted within him. Now he is only interested in the fleeting, the extreme facility of everything. Children set off each day without a worry in the world. Everything is near at hand. The worst material conditions are fine. The woods are white or black. One will never sleep. So to return to the age of childhood, material conditions are not your primary concern and he kind of goes to so far as to say that when material conditions become 
your primary concern, you become a little, little bit insufferable because then you're just making new rules. He wants to return to the state of imagination before rules even come into play. So it's not choose your dad, whether it's capitalism or you want to call yourself a communist, so communism is your dad, but even before that, where the first images of the of the imagination start coming together to produce um, experience. But it is true that we would not dare to venture so far. It is not merely a question of distance. Threat is piled on top of threat. This is as you get older, of course. One yields, abandons a portion of the terrain to be conquered. This imagination, which no, knows no bounds, is henceforth allowed to be exercised only in strict accordance with the laws of an arbitrary utility. It is incapable of assuming this inferior role for very long. And in the vicinity of the 20th year, so when you become 20, generally prefers to abandon man to his lusterless fate. And this is the condition that we're stuck in. Though he may later try to pull himself together upon occasion, having felt that he is losing by slow degrees all reason for living, incapable as he has become of being able to rise to some exceptional situation such as love, he will hardly succeed. I have to delete my face again so that you can see this little bit. So this is the fate of the of the per, the human in the modern world. None of his gestures will be expansive. None of his ideas generous or far-reaching. In his mind's eye, events real or imagined will only be seen as they relate to a welter of similar events, events in which he has not participated, abortive events. What I am saying, he will judge them in relationship to one of these events whose consequences are more reassuring than the others. On no account will he view them as his salvation. Beloved imagination, what I like most, or what I most like in you is your unsparing quality. So he is this very lofty, of course, uh, view of freedom. A view of freedom that he thinks even, you know, people like the leftist front they have forgotten about. And you can definitely see the Freudian track in here a little bit, is that you're born with this free imagination, imagination that creates associations where you have like certain rules, you have, you have the certain laws, the laws that your parents give you. And slowly and surely, by the time you're 20, the circle tightens and by the time the circle is tightened and you're 20, um, you, you have to get your job, you have to get married and reproduce. You don't actually make any choices for yourself anymore. And his problem is that by and large, everyone's totally fine with that. And the idea is that if you awoken the imagination using what he views as poetry and what he views as literature and art, then we would recognize our dissatisfaction. And the, that dissatisfaction of not being free would lead to political action, which is why it's a political project. So you can, you can show this as a, as a kind of combat. Do you do economic conditions first or do you awaken the consciousness and show the dissatisfaction first. It's not a question that we really have the answer to, honestly. Um, although it seems to be that if there are successful communist revolutions, they occur when poverty or when inequality becomes so extreme that it can no longer be ignored. And he's saying that if you want to awaken it, you got to show the dissatisfaction, which you can show uh, just comparing the life that you live compared to the life that you could live.
Yeah. I mean, I think you guys are kind of saying the stuff. I th- I just give this a hearing. All right. These are all good ideas. Maybe it's the mass production of art that destroyed imagination. Maybe it's the mass production of stuff that, you know, uh, culture industry shit. The same st- sameness stamped upon every commodity. Maybe that's what destroyed it. Um, maybe humans are the type of animal that don't give a shit about art, actually. And the only reason that we did give a shit about art in some mythic age is because the the parents of the culture, the priests or whomever, decided that that's what matters and that's why people cared about it. Um, but you got to respect the breadth. This is, what, this is his take on freedom. The mere word freedom is the only one that still excites me. Big statement. I deem it capable of indefinitely sustaining the old human fanaticism. Not sure what that means. It doubtless satisfies my only legitimate aspiration. Among the many misfortunes to which we are heir, It is only fair to admit that we are allowed the greatest degree of freedom of thought. It is up to us not to misuse it, to reduce the imagination to a state of slavery, even though it would mean the elimination of what is commonly called happiness, is to betray all sense of absolute justice within oneself. Imagination alone offers me some intimation of what can be, and this is enough to remove to some slight degree the terrible injunction enough too to allow me to devote myself to it without fear of making a mistake where does it turn where does it begin to turn bad and where does the mind's stability cease for the mind is the possibility of erring not rather the contingency of good and then he begins to talk about madness And the bit on madness is uh, it re- it, it'll anticipate Foucault a little bit because he says, we can see what happens with too much imagination um, because people with too much imagination that can't follow the rules, they got locked up. They get, they get asylumed. Um, and that shows you that imagination has to be managed and that part of this state apparatus that we exist in that we're born in that we're taught the rules of it's symbolic is about maintaining imagination and making things impossible so when you're a kid everything is possible and then slowly the walls start to come in and then if you are someone who still believes in things and act like a kid then you get locked up All right, I could keep, I mean, the stuff on, the stuff on hallucination is great. I can just summarize it, but uh, what he like, or what he, you can see where he's a surrealist with these uh, images that we have of surrealist art because he wants to, I think a big purpose of this is kind of to take the place of religion. And a lot of modernists say things like this, that in our haste for the truth and in our haste for uh, rationality or scientific knowledge, we, d- we killed God too quickly. And, you know, dreams used to have a sacred quality. Dreams used to be considered like the, there was only one explanation for a dream, and that was that a god or God was sending you a message. Or maybe if it was a nightmare, then, then the devil was sending you a message. So, yeah, there's a desire here to reestablish that mythical quality that has kind of been beaten out of you 
when your only tasks are to labor and then and then to consume This is one other interesting point here is I've never I don't know of anyone else besides uh, Breton who says imagination and freedom are the same thing because we know all the other definitions of freedom. And he's saying even before you have something like self-determination in an economic sense, which is what everyone else is talking about at the time, before you have self-determination in an economic sense you have a duty, an absolute duty to yourself to maintain your ability to imagine what is not. And that's your first, the first law of being a human as opposed to being uh, an industrial cog or something like that. Because no one, he thinks, can actually take that away from you. You can lose it, but no one can take it from you. It's the, the very basis of your freedom as a human individual. I don't know. Interest, it's an interesting formulation. It's a unique formulation. And thankfully, he's not going to leave this in the abstract. This is, this is why I called it self-help. Because he straight up gives, he gives the three rules for life. So we have secrets of the magical surrealist art. Written surrealist composition or first and last draft. So how do you do it? He's going to tell you how to do it through through writing. I'm sure you could easily imagine, you know, uh, painting or or playing a musical instrument in the same thing, in the same way. After you have settled yourself in a place as favorable as possible to the concentration of your mind upon itself, have writing materials brought to you. What does that imply? <laughs> Someone's there to bring you your stuff. Uh, put yourself in as passive or receptive a state of mind as you can. Forget about your genius, your talents, and the talents of everyone else. Keep reminding yourself that literature is one of the saddest roads that leads to everything. That's a great line, eh? Literature is the saddest road that leads to everything. Write quickly without any preconceived subject, fast enough so that you will not uh, remember what you're writing and be tempted to reread what you have written. So we're trying to or force Freudian slips. This is the process of freeing the unconscious from its rules by setting it free. Um, the first sentence will come spontaneously. So compelling is the truth that with every passing second, there is a sentence unknown to our consciousness, which is only crying out to be heard. It is somewhat of a problem to form an opinion about the next sentence. It doubtless partakes both of our conscious activity and the other, if one agrees that the fact of having written the first entails a minimum of perception. So this is actually just the process of meditation, right? That takes place in virtually every religion is let let the god come to you or in this case let the unconscious speak rather than overthinking it this should be of no importance to you however to a large extent this is what is most interesting and intriguing about the surrealist game the fact still remains that punctuation, no doubt, resists the absolute continu continuity of the flow 
with which we are concerned, although it may seem as necessary as the arrangement of knots in a vibrating cord. Go on as long as you like. Put your trust in your inexhaustible nature of the murmur. If silence threatens to settle in, if you should ever happen to make a mistake, a mistake perhaps due to carelessness, break off without hesitation with an overly clear line. Following a word, the origin of which seems suspicious to you, place any letter whatsoever, the letter L, for example, always the letter L, and bring the arbitrary back by making this letter the first letter of the following word. So it's a kind of automatic writing. I have to read the next bit. I have to delete my face again. How, how not to be bored any longer when with others. This is very difficult. Do not be at home for anyone. And occasionally, when no one has forced his way in, interrupting you in the midst of your surrealist activity and you crossing your arms say, it doesn't matter. There are doubtless better things to do or not do. Interest in life is indefensible. Simplicity, what is going on inside me, is still tiresome to me. Or any other revolting banality. Then we have to make speeches, to write false novels, and he continues. But I thought this was, the, the reason I could call this self-help and the reason that it is um, relevant not that this is a, a surrealist practice that I partake in, but if, if it's true that this is something of a, of a surrealist practice, you can see where some of these images might have come from. Um, it's not like, perhaps, I don't know each one of these artists, but it's perhaps not like every one sign is supposed to mean something. I think Dolly got this image in particular from a dream that he had. Um, and you can interpret or overinterpret all the elements. How do they work together? Why are they together? But he's, his suggestion is to continue to do, at least in writing, the first thing that comes to mind. And this is in a way, exercising your, your unconscious outside of the restraints that whatever else you want to call it, uh, the, the work a day, capitalist day, the big other, the symbolic, all of these things want to capture subcon the unconscious, I should say not subconscious. Um, and these practices that he's offering in part of his manifesto are supposed to liberate that. And what he ends up describing, of course, is more or less just a form of uh, not not mysticism necessarily, but just uh, meditation and self-aware, letting the unconscious be the unconscious and letting the unconscious speak. And not to even consider the fact that you're making mistakes. Not even to focus on mistakes. The Sufis talk about inner intoxication, but outward sobriety. Recognizing your inner mystic, I suppose. Good take. Oh, chat's arguing about free will. Free will and determination. So was Neo a surrealist at the end of of the Matrix when he flew? I don't know. Like, look, I don't know. You could map what he's saying onto so many different schools of thought. Um, modes of being, modes of practice, and it works. It's like, in, in that sense, we were talking yesterday about how self-help is kind of banal. And in this sense, it is that banality. But also, who among us believes that they have time to do this automatic writing thing? Or who among us 
even values the unconscious enough to just see what comes out of it. I don't know what the leading theory on like the cause of, of dreams are is or anything like that. A bunch of them that I've heard is like dreams are short term memory becoming long term memory or dreams are like just keeping your brain awake so that it can or that it doesn't like I don't know it's working out basically so that it doesn't do nothing while you're asleep. So there's a bunch of these explanations. I don't know anything about that. But what I do find interesting and that Freud found interesting is that dreams need to have like a, a narrative, which kind of shows something about your conscious mind too, that was new for these people that your, your unconscious is structured. Your unconscious isn't random, but your unconscious is structured that also shows your day-to-day -day life is structured in a way that's automatic. So the, automa the purpose of the automatic writing here is to free that construction because I, he, doesn't, he doesn't say it directly, but I think it's implied that this unconscious aspect of yourself is more pure or like closer to the real you. And regardless of whether that's right or not, it is interesting to think that the world that you walk around in when you're awake is narrativized by something that is not, you know, necessarily you or necessarily part of your freedom. For him, this freedom is not you because it's the unconscious and you don't have direct control over that. Just like you don't have control over almost all of your dreams. Yeah, that's why I said lucid dreaming is is super awesome. <laughs> I think there's like whole how-to guides on how to force yourself to lucid dream that involves taking like, I don't know, dr like certain drugs. You can also see how like... Um, how experimenting with psychedelics would come out of exactly something like what he's saying that you're, you're down there somewhere, your real psyche's down there somewhere and it's trapped. It's trapped by the symbolic. It's trapped by every time it suddenly comes awake, it's channeled into its proper modes of behavior, which are not changing anything ever. So the political project pre-economic even, pre-falling pre into the rules is to try to get everyone to do this, to identify with their, their unconscious. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what Deleuze said about surrealism. I don't really, like I said, it fell off. It fell off even by like the 50s because uh, Breton and Guy Debord, Society of Spectacle Guy, they, I don't know if they were talking to each other, but they were talking about each other um, favorably and then it turned unfavorably. Do you think the surrealist interest of the unconscious is tied to a critique of the bourgeois ego as free and rational agent. Absolutely. This is totally against the conception of the subject that Freud is like a critique of. The conception of the subject that he or she is this individual agent put into the world, decides rationally to be, become a part of a society you know, in the, the myth of liberalism, 
that you choose to become a part of society and now you're stuck with that choice forever. Um, and that you are in control of your own shit and that you're even in control of your own mind. I think like if nothing else, the fact of dreaming and the notion of the unconscious, whatever that means, whether it's like a Freudian or, or a Lacanian um, theater that you want to talk about, whatever that is, it's to say that like the, the narrative you walk around your life with, especially the narrative that you're a free agent at the center of the world, that isn't true. That there's a, an ocean of yourself that you don't know why it's doing what it's doing. Because if your dreams are narrativized and your life is narrativized, where, where does that narrative structure come from? And if you're, very, if you're very stupid, you will say that there's only ever been one story ever told and that the mind is full of archetypes that keep recreating them. <coughs> or you can say something smart like the unconscious is structured like a language. Yeah, Gitabor did follow it with everybody. Gitabor was kind of like an an asshole. Or the positive spin is he was a purist. To to return to that bourgeois ego thing, it's not it's not even to say that that story is like just blatantly false. It's just to say the thing, the, the narrative that you're imposing upon what you could call the situation in the situation as sense, the narrative that you're imposing upon the world that says you're free comes in the middle of the book and you're missing the whole beginning of the book. And we don't know what the beginning of the book is except for uh, looking at children. And Breton's story is that children have an imagination. They're the most free. And then by the time you're 20, you are locked in the cage. You're locked in the iron cage. And that freedom will come from awakening not just everyone's individual consciousness, but something like the collective unconscious which is the purpose of artists the purpose of artists is to wake up their their buddies which is why he comes into the leftist front and goes you know you're not making any art and you're not thinking of it as important and you're just calling us um slaves to slaves to the bourgeoisie <laughs> i'm sorry if you're 20. If you're 20, you're finished being trapped. Although maybe our adolescence is later these days because no one can move out, so. I'm too Foucauldian for this to be my taste. We rediscover pre-social freedom. Pfft. Yeah. This is definitely not going to be to everyone's taste. Well, when does... I mean, this is an interesting question. When does... Um, is there even such thing as a pre-social freedom? Because <laughs> for like Lacan, it lasts for like six months, and then you see a mirror, and now you're sh now you're s you're shit out of luck. Or uh, for Freud, when you stop breastfeeding, but for like Rousseau, Rousseau is kind of like a anti so or a critic of the social contract theorist. For him, the freedom stops when the division of labor. Starts So he kind of gives like a, a social economic reason for why we are unfree. And it's because I think the anarchists will like this. 
freedom stops when you stop making your own shit and someone else makes it for you or when you're making something for someone else, which is the division of labor. This fits with what I was, we were talking about yesterday saying like, it's better to, it's better to make your own shit. And the division of labor is what disrupts that process. But I don't think there's anyone in here who wants to like run, run their own chicken farm. I don't know, maybe. I think it's useful to distinguish the pre-social from pre-hierarchical society. Sounds like you've been reading uh, David Graeber. It's true. Hierarchy, hierarchy would be the division of labor, at least for Rousseau. If you if you doubt that pre-hierarchical society was ever a thing, I think that's what uh, Graeber's book was about. And he gives examples from, like, the Mayans. Or maybe not, not, maybe not, not the actual Mayans. Um, these mounds that were in when North America. Anyway, I don't know anything about that. It ain't my area. So if we want to get to, he gives uh, three rules and I'll read them until they get boring. And then he gives us a poem done in typography and I don't know why, and I haven't read this yet. So we're going <laughs> to look at it. The three rules for life. First, whether we like it or not, there is enough there to satisfy several demands of the mind. All these images seem to attest to the fact that the mind is ripe for something more than the benign joys it allows itself in general. This is the only way it has of turning to its own advantage the ideal quantity of events with which it is entrusted, which I assume just means there's more to experience than your mind allows you to experience. And all of the, all of the psychedelics users prick up their ears. These images show it to the extent of its ordinary dissipation and the drawback, drawbacks that it offers for it. In the final analysis, it's not such a bad thing for these images to upset the mind for to upset the mind is to put it in the way put, is to put it in the wrong excuse me the sentences i quote make ample provision for this but the mind which relishes them draws therefrom the conviction that it is on the right track on its own the mind is incapable of finding itself guilty of cavil it has nothing to fear since moreover it attempts to embrace everything and one of the sentences that he quotes, in the forest of flame, the lions were fresh. Oh, I've been, I've been corrected. Graeber's book is not pre-hierarchy, it's fluid hierarchy. Yeah, because he talks about, he talks about, um, that's a good distinction to make. Thank you, Secret Asian Dan. He talks about how there would be like uh, seasonal gatherings and seasonal gatherings which would sort of establish... Correct me if I'm wrong again, please. It was like, when did it come out? Three years ago? There would be seasonal gatherings where you'd kind of meet up with the other tribes and do like sports and shit. And a sort of hierarchy was then acknowledged. But then since it was like mostly hunter gatherer society, then the hierarchy would disperse for the rest of the year. So it was a fluid hierarchy or temporary hierarchy. 
That's what I remember. So I'm sorry if that's not the point, but. My point, my point is in the forest of flame, the lions were fresh. In the forest of flame, the lions were fresh. In the forest aflame, the lions were fresh. The mind which plunges into surrealism relives with glowing excitement the best part of its childhood. For such a mind, it is similar to the certainty with which a person who is drowning reviews once more in the space of less than a second all the insurmountable moments of his life. That's uh, your life flashing before your eyes. Interesting. When your life flashes before your eyes, Breton says, it's all, in one second, it reviews all the good shit. Some may say to me that the parallel is not very encouraging, but I have no intention of encouraging those who tell me that. From childhood memories and from a few others, there en ent emanates a sentiment of being unintegrated and then later of having gone astray, which I hold to be the most fertile that exists. So the Foucauldian is going to get upset by this, but says... Even if your childhood was shitty, you can't help but looking back on it as this charming area of experience, even if you were bruh. And his explanation of that is your imagination was still free. No matter how unfree you were, your imagination was free. Um, and that's what nostalgia for childhood is caused by. And he continues, It is perhaps childhood that comes closest to one's real life. Childhood beyond which a man has at his disposal, aside from his laissez-passer, only a few complimentary tickets. Childhood where everything nevertheless conspires to bring about the effective, risk-free possession of oneself. Thanks to surrealism, it seems that opportunity knocks a second time. I secretly hold the position that the reason that probably a majority of people have children is because they want to relive their own childhood. And not just, you know, the authoritarian father who makes his son play football day and night this is like a stereotype of 90s tele or 90s film i think it's kind of disappeared the dad forcing the the son to play football and you know the boy doesn't want to play football he wants to like be an artist or a pianist or a dancer or something and his father wants him to play football. And he has to really tell his, his dad, I don't want to play football, dad. And it's a big traumatic moment. Anyway. The recreation of one's own childhood in their children. And the children, I guess, uh, get over it, according to Breton. It is as though we were still running toward our salvation. This is in childhood. In childhood, we were still running towards our salvation. Um or our perdition. In the shadow, we see again a precious terror. Thank God, it's still only purgatory. With a shudder, we can cross what the occultists call dangerous territory. In my wake, I raise up monsters that are lying in wait. They are not yet too ill-disposed towards me, and I am not lost, since I fear them. 
Here are the elephants with the heads of women and the flying lions, which used to make Supo and me tremble in our boots to meet. Here is the soluble fish, which still frightens me slightly. Soluble fish. Am I not the soluble fish? I was born under the sign of Pisces, and man is soluble in his thought. The flora and fauna of surrealism are inadmissible. So basically, basically, if you are one of the psychedelics, psychedeliticians in here, he's saying that automatic writing will give you the same experience. And basically the purpose of the psychedelic experience is also to return you to the, the real in the positive sense, not the scary real, but the real where you are free and the world is not striated by a whole bunch of divisions. Because that's what the child sees in his mind. I'm reflecting on like whether and how, how true that is. I don't know. You get a second childhood. And rule three, I do not believe in the establishment of a conventional surrealist pattern anytime in the near future. The characteristic common to all texts of this kind, including those I have just cited and many others, which alone could offer us a logical analysis and careful grammatical analysis, do not preclude a certain evolution of surrealist prose in time. Um, coming heels of a large number of essays I have written in this vein over the past five years, most of which I'm indulgent enough to, I think, are extremely disordered. The short anecdotes which comprise the balance of this volume offer me glaring proof of what I am saying. I do not judge them to be any more worthless because of that in portraying for the reader the benefits which the surrealist contribution is liable to make his consciousness. And the last thing. Surrealist methods would moreover demand to be heard. Everything is valid when it comes to obtaining the desired suddenness from certain associations. That's basically a uh, quotation from Freud's interpretations of dreams, as far as I can remember it. That, you know, when, you, when you're in your dreams, you have um, associations that take the place of each other so for example in your dream you might have like your cousin that you know in the dream is the cousin but it looks like someone else that it's not actually your cousin and then when you wake up and the world lands back on it back on its feet then you understand uh, like why did i why in my dream did i think that was my cousin when it wasn't and the same thing with all these pictures that we've been looking at. If they are inspired from dream states, it's associating things, in a lot of cases, that should not be associated. Like this one's a good example of that. So this, this aspect of free association is obviously very important. Um, the pieces of paper that Picasso and Brock insert into their work have the same value as the introduction of a platitude into a literary analysis of the most rigorous sort. It is even permissible to entitle poem what we get from the most random assemblage possible. Observe, if you will, the syntax of headlines and scraps of headlines cut out of the newspapers. Okay, <laughs> now we know what this is. He wrote a poem by cutting up newspaper headlines. A burst of laughter, a sapphire in the island of Ceylon. The most beautiful straws have a faded color under the locks. On an isolated farm, from day to day, the pleasant grows worse. 
A carriage road takes you to the edge of the unknown. Coffee preaches for its saint. The daily artisan of your beauty, madame. A pair of silk stockings is not a leap into space. A stag, love above all, everything worked out, or everything could be worked out so well. Paris is a big village. Watch out for the fire that covers the prayer of fair weather. Know that the ultraviolet rays have finished their task, short and sweet. The first white paper of chance red will be. The wandering singer, where is he? In memory, in his house, at the suitor's ball. I do as I dance. What the people did, they're going to do. That was, I have to admit, despite the fact that there's like a hundred and something people watching me, I feel like I could have a an affect from that. I feel like I just did have an affect from that. Kind of, kind of because it's random. And then the point of it is... Um, you know, associations between these non-intentionally related words, your mind will put them together. Your, your unconscious will come to the rescue of your overwhelmed consciousness and pop up for you associations that this could be made into a narrative. And I noticed that my mind did that. On an isolated farm from day to day, the pleasant grows worse, w worse. A carriage road takes you to the edge of the unknown. Coffee preaches for its saint. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to I'm going to have to read this on my own time. This is associated like his what he's what he's calling the practice of surrealism for a writer is to do the next thing that pops into your head do not correct if your brain tells you that you made a mistake then just write the letter l and write the first letter l word that comes to your mind so it's again getting out of the idea of mistakes and Letting the unconscious speak, which is kind of a mystical little, a mystical little project there, right? That even though the words are disconnected and rather random, if they were pulled out of uh, headlines, you narrativize it. It's the same thing with uh, dream images. So childhood, this, uh, the fantasy of childhood, I think I'd call it not necessarily a bad fantasy, but what he's saying is that you, the fantasy has a basis and the fantasy is that you are free. Um, you are free from your own self editing and your own fitting into perfection of the codes, the bureaucracy, the politeness, acceptable and unacceptable behavior, and that whole system, not necessarily intentionally, but the whole system of the symbolic, of morality, of colonizing your leisure time is to murder imagination. And it, it, it's not clear that that is like some sort of conspiracy to make it so you're not politically active. But he quite sincerely wants to make a political project out of this. 
and we look back to that time when we when we don't know the rules yet but our way of returning to not knowing the rules is to do practices like this of 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 randomness and random association interesting even if you don't agree with the political project even if you don't agree with like his uh rosy view of artistic creation um i think there's a truism here that we have to acknowledge and that's that the way we communicate i said this a little bit at the beginning but i think it's uh it's more evident now what that means but the way we evaluate ideas and social media is for sure uh, playing a role in this as the like common, low common denominator of what it takes to communicate. But interpreting things purely as this um, one dimensional message, I think we can see it in basically every film that comes out too now. The message is like painted on the front. You can't. You're not allowed to even misconstrue the message because of how blatantly obvious it is. And in that sense, if it's true that this randomness or this associative quality of your mind is is some sort of intelligence, that is for sure a kind of intelligence that we are losing or have lost um, by and large. Even the practice of, like, we don't really read novels nearly as much, I don't think. So much of our experience is all media at once, like a cold experience, um, where you don't have to imagine the pictures in your head of what you're reading. So I think there's definitely some truth to the total unrandomness, and the, we don't permit language to be random at all we never permit it to be interpretable because the message always has to be like forward facing we're very literalist in that sense i would say and very primed to accept patterns and i'm not going to give specific examples of that at the moment but you know what i'm thinking of i think And what we can get out of this, if nothing else, is that already in the 20s and 30s, the same complaint that the Surrealists had with the layout of cities, um, he has, Breton has with, uh, with literature, is that reality is boring. Nietzsche had this problem. Reality is too boring. And in the process of uh, information glut, we're just chubby because we have a have a information information hose into our imagination all day. Um, we can't consider an alternative collective consciousness. Now, even if we could consider an alternative collective consciousness, who knows what that would yield? Who knows what that would produce? But in any case, that is what the surrealists were attempting. That was the image of the world that they were trying to uh, offer. And that's it for me. That was my information glut. Straight to the brain is content. Watch out for the fire that covers the prayer of fair weather. Know that ultraviolet rays have finished their task, short and sweet. Is surrealism just simulated randomness then? I don't think so. 
Um, surrealism is trying to let the unconscious speak. So the fact that these are random, right? It's not the point, oh, they're random. They are. But the point is that the connections between the stanzas or the the connection between the images, which are mental images, your mind make or your unconscious makes them because there's no intentionality. I mean, there is some intentionality, but you know, as compared to a regular piece of writing, you have to bring the intentionality to the to the words that you see on the page. So. And I, th I think they're drawing uh, attention to the fact that the mind does that because kids very obviously do this better than adults. But even even today, kids are getting sold their Marvel toothbrushes before they even know what the <laughs> what the Marvel characters are. Colonizing the imagination. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's my opinion at the end of the day, I don't know that I have. I don't know that I have all that much interest in the. Because you think the unconscious is as active as he thinks it is. Because he kind of gives it like. The center. Or maybe it's because I haven't practiced surrealism enough. I do not have a Lightning McQueen bed. Is Lightning McQueen from Cars? <laughs> I'm rethinking something that I just said. I made a mistake, I think. Like the the unconscious is not important. I think the unconscious is structuring the rest of it. But I think what he's overrating is that like changing the unconscious would change the rest of it. That's the part that I'm... I don't know that art that speaks to the unconscious is going to be better than art that is like um interpretable through layers of meaning underrated comment god of the gaps equals intention it's true Intention is like an is a cause that we apply to so much of what we see and so much of what we experience and then never second guess that intention was what brought this here. So this happens all the time with theory and conspiracy theory and writing and creation is we want to assign it all to intention. Intention is also based or is um established in like the legal system if you if you killed someone on purpose they have to determine whether it was intentional or if it was like manslaughter but i think uh i think summer is right that it's a god of the gaps intention is just what you apply to any m machine that you don't know what went in and out of it i also think it's a little bit um the world would be more interesting if we weren't just to say, like Breton says, that the unconscious is uh, a black box and also some sort of singular thing. Maybe he doesn't actually come out and say that. But my question is like, okay, so what with this? What have you done? Have you Are you exercising a muscle? Is that the analogy that we should take here? Or is it just... 
we have forgotten how marvelous the unconscious is and how like active it is while forgetting that it's there because we want to c consider ourselves free independent subjects that are not worked on by these uh, pre-conscious machines and what even is pre-conscious. But I like it. I like it. I think I'm actually... It's it's something that I'm going to be thinking about more. I'll say that. It has been affective. Especially this page. But anyway, um, that's it for me. And sorry I didn't respond to every comment. There's a lot of them, but... I'm still I'm still looking at them. I won't be talking about this too much, but I thought it would be a good uh a good little side topic from my regular content and a good little you could call it a Nietzschean an effect of a, the Nietzschean century. A little bit romantic. But anyway, Take care, everyone.